Philippines. I'm going by the first item on the agenda. I would like to invite the executive director of the Rule and Law Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa Nigeria P1, Kemi Okeyodo, to give us the welcome remarks. You have the floor, Ma. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of the board, management and the staff of um, the Rule of Law Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa Nigeria, I wish to welcome you to this webinar. Um, for those of you that don't know us, we are a non-governmental organization aimed at promoting citizens' participation in security and governance. So our key areas of focus is security, governance, and criminal justice reform. We work on the two program areas right now, our rule of law program area, which is where you have uh, interactions with the criminal justice actors, and then our citizen security program area, under which this um, particular webinar is being hosted. Sometime um, last year, before the COVID pandemic, we've always taken, let me put down a bit, we've always taken an interest in local government services to the citizens from inception in 2016. And we made an attempt to um, map the services being provided by local government to citizens and made an attempt in educating citizens Sorry, Ma, we seem to have lost you, Ma. Okay, it appears the executive director is having some network challenge. Can you hear us, Ma? Um, so, sorry, I think my, my network hear you, and I'll make it very brief. I'm trying to do three modems at the same time. Um, so I was saying that we made an attempt to educate and sensitize um, um, citizens on services being provided by local government. And that's because we see that accountability at the local government level is poor. We, commit, we commence the process of mapping um, services, assessing services provided at um, local governments. So in Abuja, we worked with, we engaged with AMAC, not that we worked with AMAC and Buari Area Council to assess the services in the primary health care, uh, under the primary health care section, under the local, uh, under the LEA, the local education um, authority, which is the primary schools, and then environmental and infrastructure, if I'm correct. Um, the, the reports, there was, um, there was some, we had observers assess these um, services across Aba and Bwari. So when the COVID Sorry, Ma, we seem to have lost you again. While we're waiting for the executive director of P1 to reconnect, okay, I think she's back. Hello. Hello. 
Hi. Hello, Ma. Hadisa. Yes, we can hear you, Ma. Hello? Yes, Ma, we can yes. hear you, Ma. Okay, so rounding up, it's to see, it's, yeah, it's to find out, it's for us to have the discussion to see if COVID is responsible for some of these challenges we're having in the, in, in that government is having in addressing, in opening up the schools, or if there are systemic and, in, and innate challenges that need to be addressed and also look at the funding even the covid funding where is it being expended is it being extended on in, in been expended in improving infrastructure or it's still today would be um, qualitative and interesting such as that we are going to be able to have concrete advocacy messages going forward thank you very much thank you very much ma for the welcome remarks which captured the summary of what this webinar is trying to achieve the next item on our agenda is the first presentation on the structural and systematic challenges on the grounds for the schools. Permit me to invite our first panelist, Honorable Oji Emmanuel Kanu, who is the National President Association for Formidable Education, AFED. AFED is an association of low fee education service service providers working to promote an enabling platform to achieve better educational standards for the populace through effective collaboration with relevant stakeholders. The association has spread its wings across various states in Nigeria. Please, sir, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Adiza. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have me here this morning. Um, honestly, I am delighted whenever I'm called upon to actually um, share with us or discuss with um, people who probably are not happy with the situation on ground or probably would want to do something with the situation on ground. Um, like um, the issue before us this morning, speaks. Uh, I'll be sharing my slides shortly to show some of the preparation we have done as an association. But before then, let me quickly say that um, uh, there are challenges, like I've been asked to speak about it this morning. There are challenges, structural and systemic challenges uh, with regard to the latest development. Of course, uh, nobody uh, prepared for the outbreak of this pandemic. Um, for us, those of us in the low cost private schools. Um, it was one of the most unprecedented perilous time in the history of mankind, as far as some of us can know and can speak. And so it will come with unprecedented challenges, definitely. For some of us, and um, it came all of a sudden, schools were at the verge of writing examinations. And um, during those period of writing examination, and normally the period we get our school fees from parents. So we usually use that as a bait or as a target is our strategy to recoup our money. So if you don't we'll brag about, if you don't pay your fees, you won't do examination. So on that note, that was the first major challenge we had that all our money was taken away from us because parents eventually, as soon as this happened, capitalized on the point that um, government have declared, uh, declared closure of schools. And on that note, there is no way they can use the pen and no, none of them knows when uh, this will last, like he has taken us this far. So they all held on to their money. And so of course, schools suffered, their teachers suffered. You can imagine teachers who have not been out of school 
since March up to today, I have not been paid. So I'm speaking from a practical example. I run a school, and my teachers have been unpaid since that time till today. That is a major challenge. Another challenge we have to battle with are clearly government inconsistency when it comes to decision making. Challenges. If we, government have, there were things they ought to have done that they didn't do. And what are those things they ought to have done? In the first instance, when we heard that this has spread to China, is what it has, rocking havoc in China, is rocking havoc in the UK, in the US. We have not recorded anyone. At that time, it was the best time government should have shut down borders. And uh, our government didn't do that. And because majority of them were outside the country, and they are, if not themselves, their children. So of course, it will be an ill thing for them to shut out their children or shut out their own. So and the whole nation have to suffer for the few people. And so that brought a hundred and huge challenge, which is about the virus itself. Another challenge probably was somebody will be looking at here, clearly, is a challenge of survival. Um, whether we like it or not, this period really exposed what the Nigerian education system is like, what the social welfare looks like. You know, Nigeria is a country where people, individuals, uh, go about their daily businesses and they live by the daily earnings. And where that was shut down and there is no social uh, welfare package, many people, I can give number of my friends, school owners, one of them in my neighborhood here, who died during this period? And why did he die? He died because there were a lot of burden, burdens of teachers on him, his own immediate family burden, and so many things around him. He also owned a bank. So all of these things, for me, I will tell you, is a challenge, not just a challenge for an individual, but a challenge of a nation. And um, then let me ask, let me add this quickly. When we say structural challenges, of course, it's obvious to us that Nigeria as a nation is actually built on a problematic structure. And so it appears nothing works. A nation that cannot get its statistics correctly, it is not as if if we want to get it correctly, there are no resources, there, there are human resources, there are material resources. Honestly, there are everything we need to get it right. But along the line, there are some kind of political undertone to ensure that it is not successful. And so, on based on that note, there is no way you can build anything on falsehood. It does not try. And that is why it appears that even the effort being made by individuals, I will quickly tell you this, that in Nigeria, for instance, my association has over 4 million children who ordinarily should have been out of school, that should be on the streets, in our kind of schools. But I tell you that we have written letters to federal government. We have done advances to some state government. It appears that this group of people who are in government do not have any interest in understanding or discussing with people who are making calculated attempts in solving Nigerian problems. I am able to tell Nigerians which time I talk that we have been able to receive aid, assistance from the UK government for more than five years or more than 10 years running. We will still receive from Singapore, we will receive from Poland, but our own nation, Nigeria, we have not seen anything despite all our efforts. So you, you will see that it is structured in such a way that when you're doing anything legitimate, it's most likely you're going to fail. It is 90% that you're going to fail. But you were doing anything illegitimate, government will soon call you either to discuss with. Of course, you and I saw most recently the most honorable gathering we had, which is the welcoming of Boko Haram, who have killed and maimed thousands of lives. And the people whose life and livelihood were destroyed are living in one IDP camp, uh, perishing and languishing without care. And they were giving a treat, a presidential treat, and giving a pardon and giving money. So what the society is that? It, does it encourage anybody to do anything meaningful? For some of us during this period, we begin to rethink 
And it's possible that we are doing the wrong thing. It is possible we are doing the wrong thing. So lack of government commitment on people who are doing legitimate businesses and people who are doing legitimate contribution to solving Nigerian problem is a huge challenge. It is a huge challenge. I must tell you, and no country thrives, no country succeeds with this kind of treatment. Let me say quickly, that is a structure that every Nigerian must correct. That is the structure that all of us must wake up to. I was discussing with a friend um, who had just been appointed as uh, one of the technical members to the presidential uh, uh, committee on Nigerian vision 5050. And so uh, what I was discussing with him, to, he, he, of course, the guy is a technocrat. He has all the vast knowledge. But however, he said it clearly that it is high time Nigeria begin to identify units that are doing things. And actually, if there are people who are not doing it right, like some time ago, when some state government will come around us and say we are not doing the right thing, I do not know what we are not doing right. Lagos state government it came earlier and said we are not doing it right. Uh, thank God for British government who came to our aid with their survey, with their research work, which was put on the table of. And again, government said, okay, we have to authenticate this. They went about testing children from our school and comparing to that of the children in public school. Ma and SAS, go and check the statistics is out there. A Durant con conducted one, DB conducted another. It shows that children from our schools, the local schools, are doing far better than the children from public school. We are not saying we, we, we are at the perfect level. There are still a whole lot of room for improvement. So when we talk about structural and systemic challenges, I will tell you, Nigerian gov governance system is bad. And the essence of governance, I've told people often times, is the welfare of the people and security first. When anybody is not secured, when anybody is feeling that his welfare is not considered, I am telling you, I am beginning to wonder the kind of nation we are building. So and, um, let, me let me add here by saying that for my association, Association for Formidable Educational Development, uh, we have used this era to ask ourselves, because within the period of the lockdown, our children were not learning. I must tell you the truth, they were not learning. Uh, about three, two years ago, the British government came and um, we carried out a survey whether the use of technology and online learning system can work in local schools. We piloted this and it worked. So uh, about a thousand tablets were deployed, given to across uh, 20 schools. And uh, of course, the, the, the research work is out there in the public domain. So it works, but I have a capacity to actually uh, increase that in various schools is what is lacking. Don't forget my background. We are actually the local schools catering for the low income household. And of course, those indigent who ordinarily do not have access or will not have had access to private school education. So on that note, it has been difficult to get them bothered. We are just discussing with uh, MTN Foundation and uh, uh, system uh, support, uh, strategic media system support, and um, uh, Samsung on how to produce a large scale, a large scale uh, tablets so that could be distributed. So currently we are, we are signing up an agreement which we are still doing today um, to produce about 2 million tablets that will be distributed across our schools, across children in different uh, locations in the nation. But that doesn't come easy. We are just looking at how we can source the fund within um, the bank sec banking sector that are available. So it is indeed a huge task educating the Nigerian populace. And I'm afraid, let me add this, that if we do not do something in the next 10, 20 years, Nigeria may not remain the same again. This is the right time to act. And um, let me stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that enlightening um, presentation and discussion and your views. But sir, we also would like to know what measures are currently being put in place 
to ensure that the schools can safely reopen. Uh, let me see if I can share my slide on that note. Um, okay, let me speak to it and think I have an issue here. Um, what measures are we putting in place? I will say clearly, as an association, one, we've been able to carry on series of uh, online meetings, just like what we're doing now, to inform and educate our people on the need for uh, safety precautions and on the need for the provision of the necessary gadgets that will ensure the safety return of children or uh, learners to the school. We went extra mile by producing an automatic bucket by an affect teacher, automatic hand washing bucket. What you just need to do is to bring your hand underneath, the water will start running. I think the Commissioner for Education in Lagos State saw it, and um, I think she was elated. And I think this is coming from Africa. So we also have procured um, in large quantity um, infrared thermometer. I think by, during the, uh, the beginning of this COVID-19, we all discovered that the cost of uh, infrared thermometer skyrocketed to about 42, 45, even 50,000 Naira Per unit, but because of our power in negotiation, we were able to bring it even for less than 10,000 naira for members to get it. And um, apart from that, we were able also to reach to where governments are responsible enough to say, Please assist us, we will mobilize your team, assist us to ensure that schools are fumigated. And we've done that in a number of states and a number of uh, local governments. And this actually to ensure that um, we are prepared. Um, oh, don't forget, government decision on reopening of school have been uh, going on uh, uh, for and through. That is to say, they will say this today, tomorrow, they would say another one. So it was the earliest time they said that schools should get ready for reopening. We did all of this. And in fact, some of the things we did, I must tell you, uh, some schools that were cleaned up, we did, we need to rebuild again. Because between the period they, they were saying this and the actual time we are anticipating schools should open, all of these things are returning back to uh, bad shape again. So, but however, I, will, I must tell you that uh, over 90% of my schools are ready for resumption. And for those who are doing, currently preparing for SS3, they are in school. We have ensured that um, fumigators get to schools, when we get those places. We have a committee, we set up a committee at the state level, at the local level, headed by the different executives to ensure all safety compliance. So in all of our schools, they visit from one school to another to see that one of the things, and we also created forms. So at the end of the day, when you look at the form, it's self-assessment, you tick by yourself. If I have this, you should be able to say, yes, I have it. If you have this, you, and once the committee gets to your school, you submit that form to them, they will use it form to actually um, uh, verify that all you have said are exactly the way they are. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And now we would like to hear the perspective from the public schools as well. So in light of this, I'll be Introducing our second panelist, Zabiodun Ese, who is a special advisor to the Honorable Chairman of Abuja Municipal Area Council on ICT, civil societies, and donor agents. She's a fellow of Cody International Institute Canada. She's a gender advocate, women leader of Nigeria Women Trust Fund, public health consultant, and a researcher. She's a passionate community leader with seven years of experience in project management, community development, and leadership. She's involved in identifying development gaps in the society and ways of bridging the gaps. Isma, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation and also thanks to my 
co-panelist who has also talked a whole lot about what the private schools are doing in preparing text to partner with West Africa for their support to Abuja Municipal Area Council in ensuring transparency and accountability in all our service deliveries in the health sector and also in the education sector. So John, by organization in some of our schools to set a, a little bag of municipal area council and one of the area councils within the FCT. So we have six area councils in the FCT. And AMAC on its own has over 150 LEAs within AMAC alone. And with that, I'll also go down to the responsibilities the responsibilities of the local government to primary schools. Majorly, our responsibility in the circle of 100 is about 10%. So we take care of the payment of salary, pension, we supervise the school, we also appoint the teachers that will be monitoring teaching in all the schools, and also some, some time training and also appointments of different uh, heads. So for AMAC, we have the LEA secretary who is like the administrative of the schools. For a local government like our own, we are not really responsible for provision of infrastructure or building some base. As a local government, we have built so many schools when this administration started and we have also renovated some schools. But we can't do it all alone because number one is not part of our job jurisdiction for we are doing this to render more services to the people because of the need for improving infrastructure. Now we have COVID-19. Some of us to really protect themselves and even protect the children. So up to now, our schools have not resumed. We are working towards having the primary six resume school, but up to now, we have not finished the arrangement for them to resume for schools. So for us as a council, what we're doing in reopening our schools, we set a lot for education within the secretariat, members of the heavy team, and also members of the health department to see what we can put in place as a can. Some of the major characteristics of our schools within the early years in the local government is the overpopulation of students in a class. We have more students per teachers within a class. So we're looking at, you know, we don't have enough structures. We have more students within the class per student. How are we going to work towards this to mitigate effect and also provide the COVID-19 precautionary measures. So the committee has been set up in place to look into some of this. So if the, the final year students are going to resume, then they could resume and use all the classrooms as their own, ensuring that their social distances are among themselves and also putting hand washing, um, and wash equipment at the school gate and also in front of their classes. It's easier for us to do that. But opening all the levels of the schools at this time will be a critical challenge for us as a report from the federal government and all those state government in helping the committee that has been set up in place to achieve some of these things. Personally, as, as, as a local government, we have challenges. Right now, we can't collect taxations. We are giving people tax free break and reducing taxes for people so that they can revoke, recover from the effect of COVID 19. We've spent a whole lot of our revenue or allocation on health going to the community to sensitize them about COVID 19 and also ensuring that there's a safe space and also equipping our primary health care centers with necessary PPEs to identify any cases of COVID 19. Now we're trying to open a school. 
the local government is already overstrained, strained by so many financial commitments to some of these things that we need to do. And up to now, it's not seen where we have a, a financial commitment from the other sister organizations or government institutions that are committed in producing or making sure that we have basic amenities put in place in our schools. We have not seen that yet, and it's still a talking process. We are open to receive the support from them because it's their, it's their, it's their support to put this amenities in place in our school. And since social revenue in Nigeria, it's time to start talking on how these resources are being used. So at the local level, what our commitment is so limited because of the resources that we have. So our teachers have been paid, have been, have been paid their salaries since the COVID-19 started because they, their own salary is statutory. As we receive their location, their salary goes straight into their account and they are being paid. And throughout this period, we've been sensitizing some of the ed teachers and principals of this, educating them more about COVID-19. We open school now will be a lot of strain on us as a local government if we don't get the necessary support on time from UBE and other levels of national government that are given the mandate to take care of some of these issues. So for now, we've done our home part in putting proper structure in place and also setting up meeting with all the sisters organizations on how we can reopen our school. So we have not opened any of our schools up to now. It's still in process to make sure that all our facilities or necessary amenities that is needed will be, will be done. Right now, there's no school that will, we, we can build more schools or more classrooms for our school. But at least they can make some other, our children are not faced, are not faced with so many challenges going to school and also contacting COVID-19. Like you all know, AMAC is the epic center of COVID-19 FCT. It's from AMAC. And, you know, we have to be very sensitive in whatever measures we need to put in place. And at this time, I'm also using this time to advocate to some of the NGOs and CBOs, CSOs, to see how they can also partner with the local government to seek support for us and ensuring that we're able to provide the necessary things that is needed to open school and also advise us on what steps we need to put in place in reopening school. With that, we know we were able to deliver the necessary services that were supposed to be de delivered to our schools. Thank you so much. I'm done. Thank you very much, Ma, for that outstanding yeah. presentation. And we are glad that the committee has been set up and we are also hopeful that um, the federal government and the local governments will do the needful to ensure that all the required measures that you need uh, put in place before the scheduled resumption of the students. Because based on uh, our ongoing assessments of the local government in Amak and Buari, um, which is being carried out by P1, our findings from the schools surveyed showed that there was a lack of proper ventilation in the classrooms and um, an issue of significant um, overcrowding. So we are hopeful that before the resumption, these issues are remedied. So thank you very much, Ma, for the insight. The next item on our agenda is the second presentation on public health as it relates to education on COVID-19. Please permit me to invite our third panelist, Dr. Orode Doherty, who is a pediatrician and public health physician 
She's also the founder and executive director of the African Children's Hospitals Foundation. The mission of the foundation is to optimize training, research and infrastructure development for care in hospitals in Africa. It's dedicated to the well-being of children while coordinating and integrating these into the wider healthcare system. Please, Ma, the floor is yours. Good morning and thank you. Thank you very much to P1 for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you, Honorable Kalu, for the um, very practical, very useful um, presentation. Very impressive work that you're doing. Um, commend you for your commitment. Um, I see you have a few questions uh, already on the chat, but um, just to say that 4 million children that's a nation you're building. And I assure you, you're not doing the wrong thing. I heard you say some of us start to think we're doing the wrong thing. You're not. Um, I think that your preparedness will certainly meet with opportunity. And to Mrs. Abiola, I thank you very much for, the, um, for your presentation also. It's very um, helpful. So I'd like to share my screen and I hope I can do so. Um, yes, Ma, you can share your screen, Ma. Go ahead. So thank you. Um, um, I'm trying to, sorry. Okay, so as the um, earlier presenters said, my name is Oradi Dorothy. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. I'll try not to speak too fast, but I find that I time myself when I'm uh, speaking. Um, and I don't want us to fall any further behind time. Um, as uh, the introduction says, I'm a physician, I'm a pediatrician, I'm a public health physician. And um, my, my, uh, this foundation, which I run in addition to my day job, is focused on children accessing healthcare at secondary and tertiary levels. Um, and I've been asked to speak on public health and education during um, the pandemic and safety measures for opening schools. I'm not sure why it's having difficulty. Okay, so um, not sure I appear to have been. Okay, so hopefully I'm back on. Um, so as Honorable Kalu mentioned, prior to the pandemic, a lot of our children were actually not meeting minimal learning standards. And what the pandemic did for us, unfortunately, was further deepen the digital, social, and academic divides. And um, uh, the disparities have only worsened since then. So what is the case really for children returning to school? We understand that children learn best in school. Um, it's a place where they are able to hone their social and emotional skills. They engage in um, exercise and in play. These are, very, these are um, healthy behaviors and they are the things that we hope that they will um, do. And these are the things that teach them about socializing. A routine and structure are also a great part of their being in school. Many children also get a lot more support when they have learning disabilities in school because school is geared towards making sure those things happen. And then many of our adolescents have complained about being away from their friends and they need to go back and they want to get back to their favorite teachers. So these are all very important reasons why um, we need our children to be in school. The other thing of course is that a lot of children in the course of this pandemic um, have faced all of the pressures that their parents are facing at home. And these include um, you know, facing illness, death in, in the home when, when this has happened. Um, they need to shield elderly grandparents has put some homes under pressure. Um, and, and so just that feeling of getting back into their routine will be an important thing. But you know, I work in a hotel, I'm sure some of you can hear some of my background noise. Um, 
And every day we've seen children actually with backpacks and with lunch bags and they're going somewhere, obviously. So I asked this first question, are children, are some children already back in school? Are they already back in some kind of a learning environment? Um, so in thinking about the safety considerations, and I'm glad that both Mrs. Essiet and Honorable Carlo have spoken to some of the things that are being done. We understand that not one size fits all, but we've got to have a national response that's guidance really that then can allow local people to make the decisions and roll them out. So the American Academy of Pediatrics um, um, stated quite categorically in their release that schools in areas with high levels of COVID-19 community spread should not be compelled to reopen against the judgment of local experts. This is assuming that we are doing what we should be doing, which is collaborating between pediatricians, educators, parent bodies, and supervising ministries, which is what we really hope to do. And I think that's why this call, is, this webinar is actually quite important because it's, it's demonstrating the need for all of these individuals to be talking. I'm a community pediatrician myself, and um, one hopes that one is engaged at an early stage of the conversation rather than much later as we think about um, children getting back into school. Um, the idea is for everybody to safely return. And therefore we have an ecosystem consideration. This is not only about children, this is about teaching and non-teaching staff, about the supervisors or, uh, at the level of the, at the, level of the um, local government and the district and obviously children and families at home. Um, and it's important to note that young children um, have a different risk profile from slightly older children who are between the ages of two and 10. They actually appear, uh, those two to 10 year olds appear to have the, the best outcomes in all of this. And then older children and uh, adolescents um, actually also have a different risk profile. So the very young and the adolescents appear to have a little more uh, risk than the ones who are between the ages of two and 10. A lot of data that's come out from Pakistan, from Sweden, from um, several countries, the UK and the US included. So, as some of the speakers before me have talked about, you know, national, the guidelines come on, national, the, the, the order, so, so to speak, the suggestion, those are from nation, from the national petroleum, I'm sorry, the presidential task force. And then statewide meetings begin, and then those intersectoral meetings between public health, between education and public health, school districts, and then cascade these down to the districts, which is how we um, organize our education here, and districts and local governments. And then those collaboratives take over and then begin to have town hall meetings that are cascaded to all schools. Um, through, in some schools, school-based management committees are more active, parent-teacher associations are more active in some, and at the end of the day, the boards are meeting. And they are provided with guidelines in detail. So certainly at national level, we have a set of guidelines. And these are discussed prior to reopening um, requirements. And these all include the risk assessments. And I think one of the colleagues spoke to that. But the risk assessments that they had carried out understanding, or I think it was Mrs. Essiet, they were knowing that some of their schools were overcrowded. Some of them um, were small and they were unable to, to ventilate adequately. So this actually, um, the risk assessment is what allows the schools to then tailor their own individual responses and know what it is that they need to be looking at. So if, for instance, you're a small school, then you know that what you need to be thinking about is either ventilation using the outside, using outside or, 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 or ensuring that you are definitely for your children are mad to and do your social distancing. So um, your risk assessment may also throw up something. You don't have water, you fetch water, well, you have to have running water, you're gonna have children. Your children need to be able to wash their hands regularly. You have that, or you're going to have, to have a lot of sanitizer and at least that. Um, if you have a very, you want to think, there are just different ways of thinking about these things. And at the risk assessment comes a compliance plan. And as part of that compliance plan, you have frequency and type of audits. And then you have your templates and your checklists. And these can be individualized for the schools after you have a general one. Because in each school now, each school will be able to determine what it is that they should be complying with, which, where's our area of weakness? Where's the place where we have the greatest risk of, you know, tripping up ourselves? And what do we need to make sure that we're doing each time? 
I think it's important to engage the entire ecosystem. I talk about ecosystems because I believe in them. And you know, we're, we're as weak as, um, we're as strong as our weakest link. Any part of that weak, then we're all going to get in, 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 in trouble. We're going to start spreading very quickly this infection, which for some people it may not be a big deal, but for some people it may be, it may cost them their lives or their capacity to continue to earn or to learn. So parents, um, teaching and non-teaching staff and children all have to um, understand the risks of transmission, the risks of returning to school, understand why we are coming back to school is because it's, it's a better way to be for children in person learning. It's certainly better. However, there are risks and in many different countries, many different things have been done. Sweden did something, for example, where they stayed in school and the children didn't wear masks. But Sweden is a country that one has far less disparities than we have in Nigeria. Two, they were able to, in Sweden, the moment you are ill, people stop going to school. Well, it's not the case in Nigeria, where even when children have colds, I've seen a child with mumps show up in school. So when something that is obvious, people still send their children to school. Something that's not so obvious like COVID until the child is very breathless or an adult is really sick. But there's no guarantee that people will do the right thing. Um, so look at what people have done in boarding versus day situation. So some of the schools in Lagos now, the boarding schools are resuming. You know, is, your large, is the school a large school? Is it rural? Is it urban? And have a fully communicated plan. I think this is really important. You know, when you have illness, you have to have a fully communicated plan for what to do when there's illness. And you have to state what constitutes illness. You know, don't just say if you feel sick, because people may not feel sick but they may have a fever, right? Uh, people may not feel sick, but they may have a bit of abdominal pain. So describe what it is that you mean that is a sign of illness and let that be known to everybody. Uh, you know, you can never over communicate during the COVID pandemic. Um, I've seen some very interesting um, types of measures to monitor. Um, audits are the things that we are most used to, checklists. Do you have this? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Very easy to do. And you can do that internally or externally. But you know, social media is, an, is, a, is a very good monitor. So if people are taking photographs of children in a school uniform, um, crowded in buses, coming to school, you know, that's just as important as, you know, the behavior, the behavior they exhibit outside is just as important as the behavior they exhibit in school. Um, and the focus is not punitive, it's correction and protection. So we want to interrupt transmission, prevent it from happening, and then contact trace. Um, it's important for everybody to know the guidelines, the NCDC guidelines. It's important for everybody in the school to know what the school guidelines are saying. There should be signage everywhere in the school. Wash your hands here. Have you washed your hands? You know, reminders, including unidirectional signage, meaning you can only go in this direction and big painted arrows on the floor or done with sticky tape on the floor to show people where they can go and where they should not go. You know, flow in this direction. Don't come back this way because you don't, you want to minimize contact, physical contact between people. And then we need to advocate for all of the infrastructure that is needed, whether it's taps, running water, soap, elbow, foot dispensers. People are coming up with really great things. And I think we shouldn't, you know, we should use everything at our disposal because, um, because we have a lot at our disposal, we should not try and reinvent the way people are making these things locally, let's just use them. Um, and I will emphasize people have, we have to have a targeted and not a blanket approach. Um, because um, if you give a blanket approach, a small rural school will not be able to do what a large urban school can do. So just think about at the end of the day, we have national guidelines, we have um, things that happen at the level of the district and guidelines, but in each school now, each school has to target their own approach. Um, continuous communication, I said communication can never be too much during a pandemic. Um, recognize that below the age of two, the recommendations are different from above the age of two. Recognize that adolescents will be adolescents and they will push the limits. You have to know how to engage them. So supporting communication between parents and guardians is essential. For young children, it's important to prepare them ahead. People say, don't just give children a mask on, the, on day one of school and say, uh, go on, uh, you are going to school today. You know, you have to have prepared them ahead. Because if you have a six year old, they'll ask you why, why, why? And they'll never stop asking why. So prepare them ahead, 
help them get excited about going back to school and teach them everything that they need to know even ahead of time. That's the importance of the town hall meetings and the district meetings and the cascade down to the PTA. So parents are already being prepared and are sharing their concerns so that they can also, you know, make sure that the children buy in. Of course, some parents are not going to allow their children to go back to school and that's okay, because I think you should do what you're comfortable with until you see that it's safe. And then, you know, show videos. Um, videos can demonstrate different things. There have been videos that have gone around that have demonstrated the effectiveness of masks in preventing droplet transmission. Um, there have been videos that have shown why it's important to have rooms that are well ventilated. When you show those to older children, they understand it and it makes it less arbitrary and they understand why we have to leave the windows open and they understand why we're having classes outside and they understand why I have to wear a mask. It just makes sense, okay? Now, one of the things that I have not seen enough of, which I, um, I, I, I would like to stress, and I'm glad that Honorable Kalu brought it up, was the importance of supporting teachers through this return. Like I said, I live, I work in Ebute Meta. Ebute Meta is high density um, Lagos, high density urban Lagos. A um, lot of teachers live in this area, and many of them through this entire period were unsupported, unpaid. So it's important to very quickly ensure that teachers can be paid promptly, can be supported with stipends, can get palliative packages, whether they work for the state, federal government, or whether they work for the public sector, because they are teaching our children. And this is a very, um, it's a very important thing to do. Mental health and psychosocial support services. I can't tell you how many teachers I've seen in this area whose blood pressures went through the roof for the first time in their lives during this lockdown. Just fear, I don't know how to pay my rent. They need those services themselves. And then they need to be trained to deliver those services to children who are coming back to school who have been under a lot of pressure at home. We know the rates of childhood molestation um, and violence went up during the lockdown. We know that many more girls were physically assaulted during the lockdown. We cannot dismiss the needs of these children when they come back to school and the ongoing needs that they will have. They need to be supported. Um, girls as well as boys. We need additional teacher training on blended learning methods. Um, and on new assessment methods. And if we're going to now be using more um, remote tools, um, Mr. Carlo talked about um, tablets. Teachers need to know how to use these methods of they brought two million tablets and then what was the teacher going to be training, uh, going to be teaching the child if the child has a tablet in front of him. We've got to learn how to use these new tools. And Sometimes teachers are overwhelmed just by the sheer number of children in front of them or by the other things going on in their heads and they are human like you and I. So they need additional, you know, Nigeria is not a country where we do a lot of volunteers, but we can begin to think about how can we provide support for teachers through volunteers. And I think this is one way to think about the, the, the thing to do with our post Y, post NECO, post IGCSE, post GCE students awaiting entry into um, university, how can they bring their physical numbers and capacity into our classrooms to provide support for our teachers? Now, I know everybody wanted me to talk about face masks, and I'll say the, the, depending on which country you are in, face masks are useful. They, they weren't used in Sweden. They're not compulsory in Malaysia, but we know that here we're using face masks, okay? We have evidence that face masks prevent transmission of infection, and we certainly know that the more people that use face masks, the more likely we are to drop the transmission of the infection. Now, the countries where they don't use them, remember that they report sickness immediately and they isolate. So we cannot go in that direction if we know that we don't have the same social and cultural behavior. Shields are a great adjunct. They should not replace masks. They can be worn with masks, but they should not be worn alone. Especially, we know that our teenagers can be asymptomatic and that's why it's especially important for them to wear masks when they are returning to school because of the risk of transmitting, not just to one another, but to the older people in the school, teachers, headmistresses and headmasters, non-teaching staff. And all children above the age of two should wear a face mask, covering their nose and mouth, like with everybody else, every time that they leave home, especially when they cannot social distance. And this is the important thing about wearing face masks. 
is when you cannot ensure social distancing. Um, we should continue to wash our hands, teach our children to wash their hands frequently. And if you're sick, please don't come to school. So I'm going to just quickly run through a few of the kinds of interventions we've seen in different places. We talked about unidirectionality, moving around the classroom and the school. You can only go in a certain direction. Some people have staggered their days. Some come um, morning um, versus afternoon, and some come on alternate days. So Monday and Thursday, and then Tuesday and Friday, and Wednesday is a clean down day. The different countries are trying different things. Um, ventilation is extremely important. So as much as possible, have classes outside if need be, as long as the weather permits. Assemblies, we know how to do those outside. As much as possible, teachers should be the ones who move around because their numbers will be fewer while the children remain in the classrooms. For boarding schools, um, this full resumption with a bubble approach, the, uh, the African Leadership Academy did it where all the children were in and for two weeks, um, they quarantined and then they are being taught virtually by teachers. Some teachers are in, some teachers are out. The NBA is also using it for their, for their um, games. So we can use, we can borrow from other industries. It doesn't have to be only what has happened in schools. Um, and I think obviously, you know, continuing this infection, especially in the high traffic areas um, and then hand washing, very important. We talked about that but also continuous emotional support for teachers and students. Now, on temperature checks, um, there's evidence that this actually may not make a difference because by the time you have a fever, you probably have already transmitted. Um, that said, it's something we started doing, so, and it makes us feel better. And until we have evidence to say we should stop it, I will just say continue. But it, it's costing, don't you heard what um, Honorable Carlo said about the cost of these things. I'm getting reports this morning that Lagos has begun to um, reopen, so we can see their children in school. This is Yaba, close to me here. Um, people are, are using the, the wash stations, and um, the children are back in school. You can see the well-ventilated classroom. On the other side also, there's a class, there's a fans. Some of them are on. Um, resources are going to be necessary to be, um, um, to be deployed to make sure this happens. There are other things to, to consider. When you have a multi-generational family, should people use masks at home? How do you get your staff to school? Children who have special health needs and developmental disabilities, what do we do with them? I say they need to be in school. We need to do everything that we can to get those children into a safe learning space. They don't have to be in a school. We, we do all the same things, social distancing, keep them outside as much as possible, make sure they continue to be with their tutors, they usually need one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that has to continue, otherwise children are losing time that they never regain. This is what we're finding. Then they are never, sometimes never able to regain that. It's very important for children who have asthma not to use their nebulizers at this time. I thought I would throw that in there. I've talked about being only as strong as our weakest link. Um, if we don't strictly adhere to everything, we're going to cause schools to become super spreader locations and then we may have to shut down. People will say we have the evidence that um, we, we should shut down. Um, so we must adhere. And this is why I love that Mrs. S had said, we are not yet ready, therefore we're not resuming. You see, you have to know yourself and do what everything, do everything that needs to be done in order for you to safely resume. The key word is safety. I do have a few questions because I'm a bit of a troublemaker. Is it possible for children to miss an academic um, year? Just one year of academics and still get an education in that time. Can we do something different with our children? Is there another way to ensure that children continue to acquire life skills and socialize? Um, and I admit this is not my original idea. I, I was made to think about this question by um, pushback I received from Fred Swanika, who's uh, the founder of the African Leadership Academy. When I said, what are you doing? How are we going to get, and he says, do they all have to be in school? They don't have to physically be in school, but can they continue to learn and acquire life skills in other um, ways? And then, you know, then you have to ask yourself, if we say our children were not learning even before this, might this be the opportunity for us to really think about this across the continent? Is there a need for a reset? And how do we ensure that our educational system does not have to go through this again in the face of a new pandemic, in the face of new changes that are probably happening um, are going to continue to happen in the next few decades. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Ma, for that detailed presentation, which has highlighted the checklist that will ensure that all the necessary measures have been put in place before resumption and the necessary precautions that should be taken into account by parents to ensure that they, their children are fully prepared to return to school um, considering the COVID-19 pandemic. Please, Ma, I would like to ask what your thoughts are on testing of the students before resumption, given the fact that the symptoms of COVID-19 present up to 14 days after exposure. Would it not be appropriate for subsequent testing to be carried out after the initial negative result? So it depends on whether you're putting children in a boarding school scenario or you're, they're going home, they're going back and forth every day. If children are going back and forth every day, it's useless to test because you will have to test every day because they're continually exposed. If you're taking them into boarding house and you're going to go and they will stay there and they will go into this bubble, then it's useful to test them, but not just test them once, but test them serially at the way the NBA is doing until you are certain that they have come out of whatever could have been um, 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 a quarantine period. So through the initial, those 14 days, when they get back to school, you first of all, isolate them individually and test, because that's what people are having to do. Put them in a room, small room, and you get your test and your, your, you start all your virtual stuff. And if you get sick, that's fine by yourself. They'll just take care of you, mask you, take you to whatever, whether the sick bay or keep you there. And as long as you don't need to go into hospital. Um, and then after the third week, then they can allow the community to begin to mix. But in the first two weeks you have been. So tests are useful if you're going to do them serially for the people who are coming into a boarding situation. But for children who are going up and down every day, it gives you a, a false sense of safety because come, come tomorrow, you may be exposed on the bus coming. Thank you very much, Ma, for that response. Um, moving on to the next item on our agenda, which is a presentation on the analysis of budgetary allocations for schools and its utilization. Permit me to invite the fourth panelist, Mr. Tolutope Agunloye, who is the Deputy Manager, Budget Foundation. Budget Foundation is a civic organization that applies technology to intersect citizen engagement with institutional improvement to facilitate societal change. Budget's methodology is deploying refined data mining skill sets to creatively represent data and empower citizens to use the resulting information in demanding improved service delivery. Beyond budget access, budget functions on the premise that Budgets must work for the people. Lisa. Hello. Um, thank you, Adiza, uh, for the brief um, introduction. Um, and I would also like to say a big thank you to the panelists. Um, I was so keen into what um, Mrs. Um, Orade I um, wanted to say in terms of um, looking at it from, from the health perspective. And I, I was really happy when she mentioned some of those things. And the question you also asked about how important is testing. And she said, it should be useless if they are not calmed in one place. And which is still part of why we're having this discussion to also see how safe it is to um, open our schools. Now, I've been taxed to talk about budgetary allocation as it relates to um, education. However, um, my discussion would tilt towards um, the federal. We know fully well that the federal is not really, is the, uh, the federal government's responsibility is not really on education. However, states have a major um, uh, priority on that because um, 
basic education, um, cash sharing and the likes should also be the responsibility of the government. However, the private side to come in to also ease that burden. Now, let me see if I can share my slide. Okay, I cannot share. Um, Adiza, if you can do something about that. Okay, sir, so we'll work on it now. Okay. You can share, sir. Please go ahead. Yes. So, um, thanks, Adiza. Now, this is um, the analysis we did before the approved budget, uh, before the revised budget. Um, the analysis really showed that um, education really is still lacking in terms of funding. It also shows that government needs to put in more money. Now, why do I say this? Sorry, I'm going to bore you with some pictures. I'm so going to bore you with some numbers. But then let's just go to this table that has to do with budgetary allocation. Now, if you look at this table, so there's this declaration called each and declaration and which is part of the commitments from the UNESCO and Nigeria committed to that and said 15% or 20% of our budget reallocation of the total budget size will be directed or channeled to the education sector. There are also lots of commitments, however. There's that of health, um, the Abuja declaration. There's that of the Greek. Abuja declaration, which is health, is 15. Um, Maputo declaration, which is for agriculture, is 10. So there are lots of commitments that Nigeria decided to commit ourselves into. However, we're not doing enough uh, in terms of the allocation. Are we meeting up with the targets? The answer is no. Now, if you look at um, the table, you will see that in 2015, that was when we tried at least in meeting up with the 15% um, commitment for education. And once it have also length, Allocation is different from spending. So you can allocate because budget is more like an estimate. And you can also budget and at the same time, you need revenue to also fund the budgets. We know Nigeria is borrowing in order to ensure that that is done in terms of um, borrowing from different um, banks, borrowing from different um, uh, bodies. But then however, uh, because of the opacity that we still have in the country, it's hard for citizens to know how well are these funds or this money spent? Now, 2015 approved budget. I'm using the word approved now. Approved is different from revised. Now, if you see the slide, you see that we had 6.5%. That was what we had. Now, the total budget size then was 10.59 trillion. Now, 6.5% is far beyond uh, the 15% or 20% um, allocation or commitment. And if we are meant to budget truly based on the declaration, but Nigeria needs to budget 2.06 trillion. That was for the approved. Now for the revised. Now because the revised budget increased by 300 billion. Now I would like to pull out the numbers. Approved was 10.59. The revised was 10.8. Eight, nine. So it's increased. Now, when we revised our budget, so I quickly googled, or I did a quick search on the budget document from the federal government. If you go to the budget office website, you can get the federal, budget, or you go to budget website, you can also get that. So I decided to do a quick control F and see PPEs, and I already saw three. MDAs that budgeted something for PPEs. I typed in COVID. I already saw maybe three organizations also that I think I wrote them somewhere. So for finance, finance did COVID-19 crisis funds, which is 213 billion. Um, same with finance also, there's also COVID-19 crisis intervention. That's 286 billion. And that was where COVID appeared in that budget. Now, for the other one, which has to do with PPEs, two organizations that I saw was Electricity Management Service, that's NEMSA, 
and the um, National Environmental Standards and Regulation Enforcement Agency. Those are the organizations that had PPEs in their budgets. Now you look at it and say, how prepared is Nigeria for the COVID intervention? Maybe the COVID intervention that the Federal Ministry of um, um, uh, Finance and Budgets probably will be distributed to other MDs. However, it was just a budget line item that was stated there. How it will be spent is not well defined. That's on that part. Now, looking at the numbers that I have, like I mentioned earlier, now we had education. Yeah, so I'm going back to this again, they approved. Now, if you see the education budget, you see that we had, for the approved 686.8 billion. However, when it was revised, we had a 20% reduction. Now, 20% reduction takes the number to um, 607 billion. So that was what we had. It's reduced the total allocation to the budget, reduced despite an increase in the revised budget. We were also thinking that, oh, probably as the budget has increased, we feel that it should be directly proportional to also uh, to the education um, sector in terms of increment. However, we had a reduction. Now, the basic education, which is of uh, the UBEC, which is an intervention program from the federal government. Um, there was 54% decrease. Now in 20, so looking at this here, the allocation for the Hubeck in the approved budgets was 101.7 billion. But in the approved, it dropped to 52.9. There was a huge reduction, which is 54%. Now the federal government was of the opinion that the reduction was because states are yet to um and assess these funds now the intervention funds from UBEC, which is from the federal government is a two percent commitment from the crf that's the consolidated revenue fund that the government is meant to budget for basic education and states are meant to also bring a counterpart fund in order for them to assess that money that's 50 percent of the counterpart fund should be brought forward before you can assess these funds However, states are not keen into that fund. Some states in the past would rather go to the bank, seek for loan to assess the education fund, but spend it on other things. There's no accountability on how these funds are spent. And that was the um, um, stand the federal government took that. Since uh, state governments are not really um, assessing this fund, so we just have to reduce it. That was their own stand. Now this is um, the chart, um, sorry, like I said, I'm going to bore you with figures, graphs, and every other thing. Now, based on what I have here, I had to look through the Unity Schools. The Unity Schools are the federal government schools. And we have one and four Unity Schools from King's College to Queen's College um, and the likes. And the government is putting a lot of funds in that sector. However, if you visit any of the schools, you would see that there's still huge infrastructural gap. Um, if I know the government won't have that capacity yet to say schools, all schools from GSS one, even from the primary to the secondary school should resume because we have that infrastructural deficit. Now we can make use, the SF3 can go into exams now and they can maintain social distancing because there will be empty classrooms. But if you were to say all classes should resume, we won't have that luxury because based on what we would track is of schools in Kaduna, in uh, Sokoto, some still receive lectures under the tree. And um, Tracker is a platform where you can get all this information. Now, aside from education, the health sector had a 25% reduction. And one thing I know that if you want to have a booming economy, you need a healthy and an educated or educated citizens. So you need this to major sector to function well, because this thing has to do with health and your, also your knowledge. 
in order for you to be productive. So if Nigeria wants to be productive, a lot of funds needs to be channeled towards that sector. And luckily for us, the sector has huge uh, uh, um, um, workers in terms of from doctors to chill, to the likes, to teachers, administrative and the likes. So a lot of people work in that sector and we need them to also function well. And for them to also function well, they need more funding. These two sectors need more funding. Not like getting others. However, those two key sectors need a huge amount of funding. Based on um, what we have, budget is an estimate. However, you need revenue to fund the budget. And Nigeria is not really doing well in terms of that. A quick um, search, if you pick up the budget implementation reports, the quarterly reports from Q1 to Q4 of 2015 to 2017, you will see how funds are being spent in these sectors. Now, from 2015, we had um, 23.5 billion for capital projects. Please note, recurrent budget is, is untouchable. Salaries has to be paid. So there's no issue on, uh, if you budget 10 era for recurrent for education, you will discover that that 10 era is spent on recurrent salaries and every other thing. They obey it like a rule and it's done. However, it is the capital expenditure that suffers the most in terms of releases. So in 2015, we had a budget capital expenditure of 23.5 billion. The amount that was released was 13.8. The amount that was utilized was 13.1. So which means we have 700 million sitting somewhere. Now in 2017, 35.4 was the allocation that's for the capital expenditure. However, the release was 22.6. The utilized amount was 20.8. In 2018, 56.9 was the capital expenditure. The amount released was 33.4. The amount utilized was 31.6. In 2019, the budget, we had 58.69 allocation for the capital. 28.1 was released, 21.9 was utilized. So it simply shows that we are not spending based on the allocation. I mentioned earlier that we have allocations that we are not still meeting up with the commitments yet. Because if we were to use the current standard, Nigeria needs to budget over 2.1 trillion based on the budget that's the approved revised one. You're meant to have an allocation to the education sector of 2.1 trillion. But then with the lead to that we are even budgeting, we are spending lead to again in order for us to be able to see the, the improvement in the capital or in the education sector, which, why, which was one of the reasons why I said that a whole lot needs to be done in terms of funding the education sector. Governments needs to partner with donor agencies, needs to partner even with the private organizations in order for them to be able to fund the projects. Now, looking at the allocations to, okay, so let me talk about the unassessed funds. So based on the data we had from UBEC, um, these are the top five states with the unassessed funds. This is based on what we saw on their website, July 2019 data. These are the top five states with unassessed funds, Kwara, Enugu, Abia, Ikiti, and Nasarawa. And these are the key projects. Some of these things have not changed. Now in the Unity School, what you will see as their capital allocate or project will be perimeter fencing. A whole lot of it has to do with perimeter fencing, a whole lot and huge amount of millions of naira 
goes into that. Now, this is for the colleges of education, and this was what was budgeted approved. However, in the revised budget, uh, we had a reduction, and um, we had uh, 55.3 billion. That was what we have for the colleges of education. For the pulley, um, there was a slight, uh, so this is a trend of allocation for the past three years. That's for the colleges of education. And for the polytechnics, you discover that there was an increase and which is part of one of the advocates that we've also been calling for in terms of showing more um, um, commitment towards the polytechnics. Now, people would rather go to universities because they feel that in terms of salary scale, university um, BSc holders receive more salaries than that of polytechnics. However, you also need the technical or the polytechnics because they do more of practicals. Aside from the university doctors and the likes, and however, those technological works, those technical works are more carried out in the polytechnics. And you discover that um, the government decided to increase uh, the capital because my own concentration is always on capital. Like I said earlier, personnel overheads that is constant. And when time you look through, you will see maintenance of vehicle, maintenance of these, maintenance of that. And if you now dig through to the capital, what you will also see will be administrative capital um, expenditure. So there are two different types of capital. You have that of administrative and you have that of developmental. So the developmental speaks towards this, or tilts towards the, uh, the students while the administrative tilts towards um, the, the, um, um, the administrators. And some of those projects would be um, innovation of um, the principal office or the painting of, um, um, of, of um, the Ministry of Education uh, headquarters complex, purchase of furnitures, those things will not really have direct impact on the students. But if you have projects like um, building of them um, or construction of, um, of schools um, in all these places, you know that definitely you're trying to bridge that deficit gap that we, that we have. Now for the pulley, um, like I said, I said there was an increase um, and um, what we noticed was um, that we had for the capital 4.53 billion was what was budgeted for the capital. And in the previous uh, budget, which is what you have on your screen, we had 2.6. And while digging through the allocations to or the breakdown of the capital allocation, you discover that those projects that you see are still administrative um, capital projects and Nigeria also needs to do more. Now for the university. For the university, um, the total that I have really did really, uh, the, the reduction was not huge. It was a 500 million um, uh, difference because the total for the um, capital, no, for the total allocation for the uh, universities, we had 219.9. That's for the approved. But for the um, revised, we had um, 291.02 billion. So the difference is just a matter of um, 800, 800 million there as the reduction. Now, these are just what we have in the budget. However, I mentioned earlier that because of the pandemic that we are in, I feel that governments would have also captured um, um, the, the PPEs in the budget for the education sector because we know that um, Nigeria is a big um, shareholder in WAEC due to the population of um, students that we have. And we should have a major say in terms of how we can influence the decision of 
other West African countries um, in terms of probably putting a stop to the examination or probably postponing it. But however, we decided to go ahead with um, writing this. And I was glad when um, Dr. Orodi shared the picture and we noticed that social distances was practiced. But that's in Lagos. If you should visit other places in, in for example, in Bain State that I serve, let's say Van Dekia, you would see that because they know that the m and es of um, the government might not be um, um, available to visit such um, a village. And they might just carry out with whatever they feel like. And we would end up having a huge number of cases. I pray that does not happen. And which simply means that there should have be a budgetary allocation for the personal protective equipment and to also ensure that at least there's a support that is still there towards um, some of these uh, public schools nationally now. Um, for Kaduna, for example, when I picked up the Kaduna revised budget, now because revenue is a major thing in front of the budget, um, pandemic has led to um, um, oil sales, oil price, um, oil price definitely, which is what we rely on, which is um, 50 or 80% of our um, revenue is on oil. And states also had to reduce their own budgets. Kaduna, for example, had to break down their budgets. So their COVID um, um, expenses and their non-COVID. And you discovered that a whole lot of amounts went into COVID um, expenditure, which is what I expected the federal government to do when we saw the breakdown. Um, with the quick set that I did, I discovered that nothing around the PPE was, um, was in the education sector, and which is worrisome. So I would like to end um, with um, recommendations like, um, like I said earlier, there are lots of donor agencies that are ready to partner with um, the government, be it local government, be it states, be it federal. In as much your books are open, um, the OGP is there, for example, and if Nigeria should embrace open government fully, um, definitely the transparency would definitely help us in ensuring that funds from private um, organizations or donor agencies will be given to the federal government, but how it is utilized is now on the federal government. Another recommendation will be on the audit report. Now, Nigeria is still sitting on the 2017 audit report. The 17, 2017 audit report for the federal government now has not been released to the public, however, the Auditor General submitted the audit report to the federal government, uh, to the Senate, sorry, to the National Assembly and to Committee of Public Accounts. Now, but they are still sitting on it. When we were in 2020, so what happens to the funds that have been cutted away through corruption from contractors and the likes? Who is going to call these contractors to order to be able to retrieve all these funds from them, for, especially for those funds, those projects that were not implemented? And education has a huge amount of, um, of share on these um, on completed projects. So Nigeria needs to extend up in terms of the audit reports, releasing it to the public and ensuring that the committee also work in line with the presidency when they submit their own suggestion in order for them to be able to retrieve all funds that has been mismanaged. Yeah, so I won't talk about the curriculum upgrade and like, so I, I feel that whatever decision we make for those classes that are yet to resume, we should have a uniform curriculum so that those in the public schools will not be left behind. The private can will have their way around it, especially for the rich, can get a private tutor to teach their children. But then what happens to the public 
students. How are you going to ensure that whatever they've missed in the second term, the third term, they can also fit in back into the first term when school resumes fully, hopefully, next year, January. So that would be my submission on, on the budget reallocation and the spending. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that very detailed um, presentation and analysis. And I'll get back to you on questions during the Q&A session. So please permit me to move to the next item on our agenda, which is the presentation on income for school teachers and other workers, the livelihood and welfare of key stakeholders in the face of COVID-19. I would like to invite Mrs. Abiodun to share her thoughts on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for, for the question. Can you hear me well? Yes, ma, we can hear you well. Okay, I think for us, it's important for, for us to work towards the management and the care of uh, necessary stakeholders, the teachers who, who will be in charge of some of the development issues in opening of schools. So for us, we've been paying salary, but you know, despite that, it's also to get the necessary precautionary um, materials to the teachers before opening of schools. And I'm sorry, let me change my background because there's a background noise here. Okay, ma. While we're waiting for Mrs. Abiodun Asset to come back, um, I would like all part uh, participants to please ensure that the questions they have for our panelists are being written in our chat boxes or the Q&A box. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, concerning the welfare of major stakeholders concerning the COVID-19, for us as a government, we're working towards um, providing palliative measures with support of civil society and also the state government to some of our teachers and parents. So while there was a lockdown, the home growth school feeding program was also, uh, also shared some palliative to parents of students within class, primary class one to three to support their, you know, their children during the lockdown because we understand that parents find it difficult even to make hands meet and also parents were depending on daily income. So we had to give them voucher under the school feeding program. Vouchers were given to parents per, per family, not really per child. So if you have two children, within the class of primary one to three, you will be given just one palliative measures. Um, and that's been the way that the government will be trying to protect them and also take care of them. And also for members of our, of our team, as a council, we, we're not really working um, from home. Most of our workers, who are from level 16 above were still coming to work for Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays to keep going, keep the administrative work going. And with that, we had to set up um, measures like hand washing and checking of their temperature when they're coming to work. And all our institutions and establishment, not just in the sectoral area, but also within the primary healthcare centers where you know, they receive treatments and PPEs and also help identify patients that have 
signs and symptoms of COVID-19. So we had to put that in place. For AMAC, we've had um, some episodes of COVID-19 um, in the sense that some of our staffs got infected and one died in process, another one recovered. So because of this, you know, we've had, uh, we've been able to do contract tracing and also inform some of the people who are closely related to some of the people who are infected to be on isolation for 14 days before returning back home. So we are, we, we are really, really concerned about the health care of the health care provider because some of our health personnel have been all over the community working around the clock to ensure that everything everything's going on smoothly to ensure that the cases are reduced. And so most of our health workers work more than the normal hours they work. And we, with that, we are also trying to give them incentive and also making sure they get some necessary palliative measures to help them recover and also to help them to adjust to the new uh, work situation. So, and also for parents, like we said, the salary for teachers, the salary has been consistent every month, they've been paid salary. And because it's a statutory kind of, uh, plan so they have been taken care of and we also encourage them to come for meetings and also listen to some of the measures that we have put in place and also share their fears and observations about any 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 of their concern in reopening of schools and also other necessary you know things that needs to be done so for us we've been doing a palliative we We've been taking care of them with incentive and also making sure that their working condition is safe and secured free from COVID-19. I don't know if I touched the areas you wanted me to touch. Yes, Ma, you have. Thank you very much, Ma. It's great to hear that the palliatives are being distributed to the teachers and um, parents to support them in these trying times. Yeah. I would like to um, invite Honorable Kano sir, to hear your views as it relates to private schools, sir. Oh, thank you very much, Adiza. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for having me again. Uh, let me quickly say here that uh, uh, I have been further uh, enriched with knowledge, especially with regard to the um, uh, preventive measures as uh, illustrated and discussed by doctor. Again, what actually made, made me wept along the line here was our budgetary allocation. It's not as if uh, we do not know a little about it, but each time it is analyzed this way further, it makes me weep. Um, I, I must tell you the truth. Uh, a nation that uh, plays around with its education, it's a pity, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, it made me become more sober. And I do not know when uh, the right people will be in government. Honestly, I, I am just confused as to what this nation is becoming. Um, of course, we talk about unassessed UB fund years and years after. And uh, we've been hearing about this. I was in a meeting one of the occasion with uh, 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 Barrister, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, the famous Barrister, Femi Falana. He was talking about over 500 billion that has been unassessed. And that was two years ago. And coming to this year again, we are still mentioning the same thing. I think well, we're having a problem. We need to get it right. But let me quickly talk about palliatives with regard to um, private schools. Um, my members uh, in Delta State received um, a palliative from the Delta State government, I think, but not all of them. In Lagos State, just last week, we received um, about 30 cartons of uh, Bonvita, uh, which has um, uh, 12 uh, um, bottles in it each, and we had about 350 cartons of Maggie and um, 80 bags of 5 kg rice, 
and um, and a whole lot. But I only they left me confused because only in Lagos we have over one hundred eighty thousand teachers in these schools in Lagos alone. And so I, I became more confused than when I had not received such gifts. But however, I told my plan admonish anybody who gets, even if it's a market, it shows the spirit of Lagos State Government. Uh, uh, honestly, it may not be that, it's clearly that they would have done more if they are in position of they have capacity. That's what I have to believe. Because if they have done this far, it means they would have done more. We also have received um, donations from people, people in Poland who began to contribute just little, little money they can. And they sent to us. In fact, in terms of uh, nose mask, we have produced a huge number. Our target is to produce about a million or thereabouts. And uh, as I talk to you today, they, we have received reasonable sum from uh, Poland to produce that. Uh, our national patron, Professor Patu Tomi, also has done his deeds. Um, did for people in Makoko, in Surulere, uh, and um, Bejuleki. But in as much as all of these have been done, but I tell you, this is still grossly inadequate. I imagine 180,000 teachers of a plus, and this kind of. So we have only told our members, do what you can at this moment to survive. Some of them are taken to a selling of granite. Some of them have taken to working in bread factory because they just have to live at least this period. And um, it's been a hard time, I must tell you. I wish we are still open to receiving because even when school resumes, it will still take a very long time for schools and life to return to normal so if it's possible and for people to adjust. So um, we barely can tell you that um, palliatives have not been forthcoming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So I wanted to further ask, um, maybe if you can enlighten us as to what can be done to ensure that our teachers in the private schools are not laid off in these times. Oh, well, um, thank you for that question. I must tell you that uh, some of these teachers on their own will not even return because their future is not guaranteed here. Uh, for, the, for, for the past four months, for instance, Somebody have not been paid. So what guarantees the future? So uh, in, in that kind of, some of them are family people. Well, for those of them who are already there, it, it's unfortunate. Um, school, people can only do what they can do. And I've always told people that students and teachers who are in these schools, they are not there as a result of choice. They are there as a result of necessity. Students who are there, some of them do not have, where public schools are available are not very close to them. Where it is available and close, they may have been oversaturated with population, overpopulation. So all of these are reasons why our schools exist. And plus, restiveness and other areas where government presence are completely not there. I will tell you, like in Lagos, for instance, they have 1,700 uh, 1, plus schools covering over, um, of course, we have over 25 million people. And look at, there is no family that don't have one or two people who are going to school. And what are the infrastructure available? So these schools must just exist. So uh, laying them off, nobody has that plan. We don't have that plan at all to lay anybody off. But the truth is that the reality is that oh, the school can only pay what it receives. It cannot pay what it has not received. And on that note, I, I, mean, I even have a whole huge fear that some of these schools will not open as school begins to reopen. Thank you very much, sir, for that response. Next on our agenda is the presentation on the possible implications of online learning lack of social interaction on children's development and mental health. Please permit me to invite our fifth panelist, Dr. Friday Philip Kinchama, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry, University of Joss, 
and an honorary consultant with the Department uh, of Psychiatry, Josh University Teaching Hospital. He's also a child no, and an assistant mental health professional and a member of IACAPAP and IACAPAN. Dr. Chungama was also part of the team that carried out a psychosocial assessment of children, parents, and caregivers in light of the 2017-2018 armed attack on Dong and Kikan communities in Adamawa State. This assessment was carried out as part of P1 Citizen Security Project on engaging children to counter violent extremism. Please, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Adiza. Thank you, Adiza. Thank you, other members of the panel. Thank um, you, sir. Welcome. I'm glad to be part of the, the discussion. And uh, I wonder why most of the time when we are discussing issues with, uh, that has to do with COVID-19, the mental health issue comes last on the, on the, time, on the menu. Anyway, I'm also um, a, uh, a lecturer with the University of Joss, uh, teaching the medical college where we interact with medical students of the university. But unfortunately for us, we have not gotten any palliative from the government. And I wish this uh, discussion will be, will have involved the government official too, to be on part of this uh, panel, panelists, so that we're able to discuss it in details. Are you there with me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. I am with you, sir. We can hear you, sir. Okay. So, um, yes, uh, we, I, we just want to relate the issue of, uh, uh, of COVID-19 with mental health and also issue of e-learning in schools, uh, especially when this uh, time we were thinking about reopening the, our schools uh, for our students to, to, to be involved in learning. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, we know that uh, this COVID-19 has caused a lot of global disruption in our lives. And uh, we, it's akin to a catastrophic event that generated intense fear in the world. Yes, uh, this fear um, is so enormous that uh, each and everyone is so involved, is also affected from the children to the elderly. And um, it has also um, caused a major disruption in our social engagement, also in the Christian attainment. Uh, many countries of the world have had to shut down their borders and also school. And we have, we, from statistics that, we have, that is available, we know that about 1.9 million students, billion students all over the world are also involved and out of school. But we thank God that gradually things are easing up and things are coming back. While the most hit uh, countries are those ones that have low resources, that have poor resources in order to cope with the inconveniences or the disruption that COVID-19 has brought to us. So it's very difficult for each member country of those low countries, low, low income countries to be able to do e-learning adequately because of lack of infrastructures and measures to enhance, enhance learning. Uh, we also know that, uh, that a crisis situation like this is uh, also known to cause trauma to, hello? We can hear you, sir. Okay, this, uh, can I just, just, can I share my own screen better than, because I can't control it here. Okay. So what are those impact? Because I would just want to let link the crisis situation, traumatic situation to, um, to COVID-19 because they, they, both of them causes trauma in the individual. And trauma, most of the time, is something that uh, if naturally you are, you are exposed to, would cause a threat to your life and, and death. So in traumatic uh, events all over the world, uh, it has been shown to affect our mental health. 
And the impact this causes on children is so enormous. Studies have shown that it causes them to, to like how to express their emotions. And it also changes their behaviors and conduct. Uh, we've noticed that their behaviors can, they can start turning tantrums. You know, they can start having deviant uh, conduct uh, problems, or they can also be involved in uh, school truancy or delinquency. delinquency. It also up, uh, affect the hyperactivity or the activity of the child. Uh, we have noticed also that, um, that the activity of the child increases. And once there's hyperactivity, it also leads to what? Lack of concentration or paying attention in the class. Or even if you're doing e-learning, the concentration will be very low. And by then the child will be able to grab, have a grasp of what is being taught online or what when school resumes. We know that um, in studies, it has also shown that relationship and friendship uh, uh, issues have come up in children that are exposed to trauma, especially armed conflict. And uh, this also has caused stress on the child and also impacted on the family. It also affects learning because as conduct or hyperactivity disorder comes up in the child that has been traumatized, it will lead to lack of paying attention in class. Um, armed conflict normally causes disruption in, in school calendar, especially when children are displaced from their, play, from their area, from the original area or natural place of abode to maybe IV, IDP camps or to other relatives. So it causes disruption in their schooling and also affects the calendar. And also sometimes the structures that these students learn in school is also destroyed. Okay, and we know that uh, in recent past, with this insurgence and uh, terrorism across the country, uh, so many teachers have been killed, especially uh, by the Boko Haram uh, sect. And this has caused reduction in the number of teachers. And because of that, we know that uh, some, sometimes emotional and psychological well being of a child is well simulated while in school. And this has been done by teachers. And this has also affected the child's uh, mental uh, well-being. The child, because of he lacks one teacher or he learned that he's one of the teachers, he is dead, he might likely develop what we call insecure attachment to any other person that must come away, uh, come, come his way. Because he's so used to the other teacher, but he's, he has been killed in the in uh, in, 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 a, in an attack. Uh, remember the Boko Haram, the incident in Chibok and other places where teachers were killed and this has caused so many, things, so many emotional disturbances in the children. And this will also lead to so many psychological problems that are in life for this child. Um, hello? Can you please go there? Okay, good. So what are those, what is the impact of this COVID-19 on, on school shut, uh, shutdown? Well, uh, the experiences or the news or the, the outburst, uh, outcome of this uh, COVID-19 has created a lot of worry, anxiety, and fear in us. Uh, children are afraid of dying or being uh, infected, or they are afraid of receiving medical treatment if they are infected with the, with the virus. And because school has shut down, also created anxiety uh, some students will start wondering when will I be able to complete my secondary school. They are in SS3 or they are in GSS3 uh, and they are, they've been home for three months. And they're wondering uh, how will I be able to cop graduate from this country to move to the next level. And also in the university system that we, it has been shut down for a while, even before the advent of the COVID-19 because of ASU strike and other things. Uh, students are afraid that they, uh, they have spent much time in school and now compounding the COVID-19 is compounding their problems so they won't be able to graduate on time. So there's this fear and anxiety. And when this fear and anxiety becomes so persistent and beyond one's control, it turns out to be a disorder, a mental disorder, which we normally call anxiety disorders. Uh, we know that children uh, out of school have reduced opportunity to, to be with friends and also socialize with friends. Uh, having friends, you know, mitigate some of your problems and socializing is like you're bringing, bringing, uh, bringing up your social network and, and, and that will help to you to progress in life. So with the closure or the shutdown of schools, 
um, the aspect of uh, interaction, social interaction that these students normally enjoy while in school is being diminished. And this also can affect their mental health. It also reduced the emotional and community stimulation normally acquired in school for interaction with other peers. We know schools are self grants for normal cognitive development. This is where there are some challenges, some quiz, some, some, um, some competition among peers about uh, who comes first in the class, you know? So it, it, without school, that cognitive stimulation is going to be affected. Even by doing uh, e-learning, you're always, always on visual, uh, on visual, seeing somebody from another site without having this physical contact, it also kind of uh, diminish uh, the social, uh, the emotional stimulations. And um, we have still have shown in America and Canada that uh, that uh, visual learning after the exam, visual exams or e-learning exams, they find out that the grade level supposed to the students supposed to have gotten is also reducing by about two point seven percent. So a, a, the a student that's supposed to have an A because of that uh, interaction that he had with his teachers, physical interaction, and with the other student that bring in competition is also diminished while having in learning. Uh, there's also reduced social support and social for growth, um, uh, growth for good mental health being. Yes, without uh, sometimes students might have problems at home, but when they get to school, the teachers can lend a helping hand or give a shoulder for the student to be able to express his own, own feelings and uh, how he feels about his family. But because they are no more in schools, of course, because of the impact of COVID-19, that is going to be reduced. The social support is going to be reduced. And that will also lead to have mental issues. We are in the United with issues of rape, molestation, and abuse, as well as this closure of funds from uh, closure of schools. Um, we There's a spike in the rate of uh, sexual abuse on children or rape. Uh, in the last uh, few months, because students uh, students at home, uh, and then uh, they are being molested by a non relative, uh, and this is just because uh, in our society we, must, we know that we have a large family size, and overcrowdedness can lead to that, and also lead to exposure of the children towards to all manner of uh, molestations. And so they have shown that children that have been, that have been abused, or phys both physically or socially, or been neglected uh, in childhood might end up developing mental issues in adulthood. The social studies have shown that majority of, about 50% of people that develop mental illness in adulthood, majority of them they started having this mental issue before the age of 14. So if a child is being molested, you know, his brain is going to be recognized to feel the words against him. And the only way he can retaliate is as to give back to the world or to us to, to, to internalize his problems. And that could lead to issues like mental illness, like uh, depression and anxiety. Children being at home, because of that compactness of everybody being at home at the same time, you know, it might lead to lack of that social space to move around and it can lead to irritability and anger in these children. Also increasing demands. Now children at home, the the, the, they tend to have more domestic, cho uh, domestic chores to handle at home. So that increases demand and that could also lead to frustration because in school is from either you wake up, bath, go to class, read your books. Uh, after that, you come back, eat, eat, take a lunch, maybe uh, take a nap and then go back for preps and come back again and rest. So they rarely do any domestic, ch uh, domestic chores apart from uh, maybe morning chores that they do once in a while. So it also increases the, uh, the demand on children and also, also increase demand on parents too, because uh, parents have been complaining that their full stop at home is getting finished all the time. So that's one of the impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on children. Yes, this closure has led to what? There's no loss of schooling period or education as a whole. So the, with that schooling and education, the child potentials or capacity for him to, to exhibit his full mental health well-being is being diminished. And that has also could also lead to what health difficulty, mental health difficulties or problems. Yes. Okay. 
How do we link this uh, uh, trauma or the assessment that we had at Kikang and Dong villages in Adamawa State? Yes, we, we undertook uh, a research or a psychosocial analysis on uh, children in Kikang this January. Uh, these children were exposed to, to armed conflicts, armed attack, which some of their villages were attack and houses bound school were disrupted. And um, P1 um, came up with uh, an informal form of education to really help these students to cope and to able to graduate from schools. Um, the informal is not like the, the, the normal grading system we have. You know, the category is to the students based on their ages into three categories. The first category comprises students between the ages of um, uh, six and uh, and six and seven. Then the other one, eight and nine, that's the second category. Then the second one is 10 to 12 ages. And those one, those categories, the first category comprises of students that are between class one to, to two. Then the second category comprises of students between class three to and four. The third one, students that are in class three, that mean class five and six. So we, we undertook that assessment. Uh, we were supposed to have seen 200 pupils, but we, we were able to come up with only 117. Um, the three have very, uh, various problems. One could not return back from holiday, one was sick, and the other one um, was lost out, just dropped out without any reason. So we undertook this assessment there. The aim of the assessment was to, was to ascertain the mental status of these children how it affects schooling and performance solution. We know that um, the trauma itself affects our emotion, affects conduct. So how does this emotional problems or conduct problem affect the way the child lands in school? So we need to know what how many children have these problems, have these mental health issue problem, problems and be able to provide solution to them. We also assess their parents and teachers mental health status. How do they affect their caregiving potentials on these pupils? Yes, the parents too and teachers were also exposed to this trauma uh, that took place uh, in Kikan and Dong. And we we turned with we 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 wanted to, the aim was to find out do they, they have mental issues? And if they have mental issues, how did they how did they cope with uh, taking care of their children? And does this mental issue in the parents affect their 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 pupils or does is the mental issue in teachers also affect the way they impact knowledge on these students. So we undertook this uh, assessment and uh, we... Please, can you go to the next slide? Hello? Hello? Sir? Hello, I'm, are you with me? Yes, sir, we're with you, sir. We used about two instruments to really... Um, to really get to assess these children, we use what we call strength and difficult questionnaires, which uh, determine the problems area of the of the of a child, and also the strength the child has during the uh, when faced with problematic events or trauma. The other one we is that we try to find out the impact uh, of this trauma on these individuals. How has it impacted on their life, and then also how is it affected their schooling. So the first one we, we call the SDQ strength and Development questionnaire. The second uh, tool that we use was the children's reverse impact event scale um, with various, with various uh, subscales among them. Uh, our finding there is that we found that um, we have uh, a, a more female being registered, being enrolled in these schools. And which is like a, like a normal pattern in the northern part of this country, whereby the female enrollment in school is very poor. Uh, I think our male, uh, we found that about sixty-one percent of the male were enrolled, while about thirty-nine percent of the female were just enrolled, which even less than the normal enrollment uh, percentage or proportion found in the north. Uh, overall, the strength and difficulty questionnaire subscale uh, scale, uh, the, in the parents rating. Uh, because we give it to the parent, individual parent of the child, and then to teachers of that particular child to really rate how the, the how the how the child behaves in the class or behaves at home. We found that 22% uh, of uh, uh, of the children were rated to have 
problems, difficulties, while teachers rated only 12% of the people. This disparity, this variance is quite, uh, uh, is quite significant. So we cannot adjust, you really use uh, the rating of teachers to really come up with uh, concrete evidence say that uh, this, the rating, the way they rate their children, the, the, the parent and teacher is, is the same. Anyway, uh, under the SDQ subscale, we have the emotional problem scales, the conduct problem scales, the activist uh, problem scales, and the peer relation problem scales. You know, the peer relation scales still has to do with social interaction. And uh, we find the parents rated 28% of the people to have problem in relate, relating with their peers, while teachers well in school rated only 22% of these children. But overall, on the strength scale, both parent and teacher rated all people to have strength to mitigate these difficulties. So they have shown that uh, children have resilience uh, to cope and to persevere over issues, over uh, issues. So it means that this rating will, uh, will help children to able to, able to cope with uh, adverse effect. On the impact, uh, we find that the, so many children, uh, about 11 out of, uh, uh, out of these 11.5% uh, of the 117 people, the uh, difficulties impacted most finger on the community they were in. While teachers rated only uh, to 1% of the children to be what to that they're, that they're difficult to have impacted on the children. Uh, the time is fast spent, but let me just go to uh, other issues. Uh, anyway, we, we concluded that that these children have issues uh, in school, that this trauma has caused a lot of issues in them. So if trauma itself can cause issue or crisis can cause issue, we believe that COVID-19 could, could also cause issues on children because crisis is like a crisis situation where children are, children are at home. So we, um, we recommended that the creation of advocacy program for peace and conflict resolution should be, should be, in, should be involved in, that, in those communities. We also build a safe environment for a sense of safety, creation of social support groups to really help out, and also creation of social playgrounds for the children to be able to interact very well so that it will improve their peer, peer relationship. And so incorporating school-based mental health programs in these uh, schools, and also to establish trauma healing centers to heal the wounds of the trauma, the heal of the uh, heal wounds of the crisis. Um, going further, um, how does this uh, shutdown, of prolonged shutdown affect the mental health of the children? As I said earlier, it's likely to cause uh, anxiety and worry, reduce opportunity for friendship, reduce social support, and then uh, also increase irritability, increase demands, and loss of school ed and education. How do we prepare our students or our students for reopening in schools? Uh, we need to tell parents, or parents need to know that we need to start talking now about how possible for school uh, on school on school reopening and to make decisions on plans for the school year. We have to start preparing our minds to, and then our children that yes, you have to go back to school and then you take decision of buying books and doing other things that we need, to, the students will need to the school. Also, we need to identify uh, uh, like a, a point in the, in the school to contact in case if a child falls sick. Uh, while they're discussing um, uh, on public health, main mention of uh, that we need to uh, check our children very well before going to school. And even they are sick in school, we need some that report back so that we can even convey them and then maybe quarantine them. Talk to them while that we are all still learning about this virus and the following measures should be taken. We need to talk to them about keeping physical distancing in the social gathering. When they're in school, they should maintain these uh, meters. They should maintain uh, two meters gap while sitting. And then also we need to purchase masks early. You know, when they are about to up, go to school, maybe on Monday, we start thinking of that by getting the masks for them on Monday to prepare the masks and then practice and rehearse how to use the masks uh, constantly. We also need to uh, to review goods and uh, hand hygiene. You know, we, we let's, let's make it a fun, you know, uh, teach them how to wash their hands properly 
And then when they're doing that, you know, we normally say that we should wash hands under 20 seconds, you know. But doing that, the child might not be able to time himself. So when he sings his happy birthday song, you should be saying, as he washing his hands, you should be singing happy birthday song twice while washing hands. And just make, make it a fun. The child will get used to it. You know, children, the life play. Uh, we should develop daily routine before and after school, uh, like packaging of hand sanitizers and things to do with back home. We should make sure that uh, your child is up to date with this, all, uh, all the vaccine, vaccine that's needed. Students should also def define, should, students should definitely stay at home if they, are, if they have fever. And, and, and we should also check temperature and find out about sultures. We should also prepare and reassure our children that things could change unexpectedly. Because we have seen some places like in Ghana where they were opening schools uh, and France, and then there are suddenly there was a spike in the in the in the new in new cases of uh, COVID-19. So we need really to change. So what are those things to be done uh, to, to, to improve children's development in school uh, when when they are when they are still close? Parents should show love and attention to children to resolve those fears. And we should be honest with our children, tell the truth about COVID-19 and why they are poor. Uh, let them spread themselves through creative activities at home by giving them things to draw, painting, playing in a certain environment. We should also maintain safe, healthy routines and developing new healthy routines. You know, if they are, the routine they're going to have at home should be a haphazard kind of routine. It's a routine that they will get used to it and then they will enjoy doing it. And if you don't, if a parent doesn't, if a fan doesn't have a routine, you should develop a new one so the child can cope with being at home. Um, then we we'll avoid separating children from families in case if any parents have this, but we can we can do that by using engaging social workers and also have a time schedule for telephone or video calls just the way we're doing now. Uh, Erling is uh, e-learning if there's a means. What I mean by that is that uh, it's not every home or every family that has the means to have internet, uh, have access to internet or to computers. But we thank God that uh, some NGOs are coming up, and especially in Lagos, where um, the Honorable uh, County can told us that there are some uh, uh, iPads given to, to schools to help them out. So engage the children in mild exercise and let them eat balanced diet, you know, to stay uh, okay. What are those websites that we could use to assess uh, information? Or we can advise our parents to have to assess information to help their children while they are at home. We can give them the CDC website, the CDC website of America, Ministry of Health website. And this provides so many information about how to combat COVID-19 now, how to reopen my school. And even for the school to how to stagger the resumption of, the, of, of students back to school. Some of the things that we use uh, for e-learning, uh, there's some, app some applications that we use for e-learning, um, like the Khan Academy Kits, the Khan Academy, the National Geographic Kits. These are apps um, that one can download from PlayStation or Google Store and to help his child to, to cope with the, with the long stay at home. And also teachers could use uh, Google Meet and Google Classroom or Zoom and for interaction with their students while at home. I think for now, I'll stop here. Uh, sorry for taking much of your time. I, will, I went beyond the, the 20 minutes, isn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate that insight and the details that you've been able to extract to help parents to be able to keep their children engaged and properly prepared to return to school in this new normal. So we appreciate your presentation very much, sir. Permit me to make a slight adjustment to our agenda and move to the question and answer session. Um, I'll just be reading out some of the questions that have been asked by our participants to the panelists.
So um, the first question I have here is from directed to Honorable Palu. And um, the participants thanks you for your presentation and is asking why are low cost schools not using the same measures of many developing countries and Lagos states to use television, radio and mobile technology to conduct education. Though it has issues, it is seen across the globe and in Lagos state, for example, to be the best medium for teaching and learning. Why is it not being rolled out in low cost schools? Lagos State has just signed a partnership with a bank to produce and distribute locally made gadgets for learning. It has been tried and tested and some already rolled out. Why are you starting all over again when there's already a model that exists that you can leverage on? We don't need imported gadgets. We have locally made gadgets with local curriculum. Why are you not looking at leveraging on this? In addition, some of us running NGOs have also started working with our communities using hard copy materials, going to communities and ETC to teach and monitor the learning of the children. Why are local schools not doing this? Surely, surely this is beyond school fees now. Surely the low cost schools need to start innovating for survival. Yes, um, I think you want me to respond to that. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, I also want to thank uh, the person who has asked that question. Um, uh, actually, uh, the time allotted for this discussion today uh, definitely is not enough for us to begin to uh, delve into what AFED is doing. Uh, AFED is doing a whole lot. And when you, and like again, one of the reasons for this uh, kind of meeting is information sharing. Uh, like she said, um, NGOs like hers and uh, other people are doing so many things. I think she, I, would like to have a contact to show me some of the things she's doing and that we can leverage on. But I know quite well when she's talking about existing infrastructure, uh, like the television and radio, some of these things have its limitations too. Uh, it's not as if we are now, uh, 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 it's not as if we are not aware uh, uh, of uh, the availability of uh, radio, television, academic activities. Yes, we have encouraged our people to be part of it. But the basic truth is that you and I know, you know, when we're talking about the kind of schools we, uh, we, we are actually working with, or our kind of schools, they are in the most difficult terrain. Some places where there are no electricity, you cannot guarantee any electrical appliances. And so all those kind of things you're talking about hardly exist. It exists in the houses of their kings. And so all of them cannot convert in their thousands of their king with the restraint of COVID-19. So uh, this gadget we're talking about, television, radio, apart from the way it is even available. Have you considered the power supply situation in Nigeria, which is, um, uh, which is quite epileptic? And apart from that also, you will agree with me, some children in their own character cannot substitute any face-to-face -face learning to maybe merely listening. Don't forget the barriers in li merely listening to television. You, you can't explain, you can't ask questions. So, and once a child misses out through one explanation, it then means you will, may lose interest in joining in subsequent classes. So these are some of the things that we, it is just for those of them we were able to convince to join, it was just a, 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 a make up complementary, it can never replace a real classroom situation. And uh, even in America, uh, in, in the UK, one, during this period, one university has uh, told the parents that we, everything will be going online. And the parents uh, in the UK protested that it can happen. How much more in Nigeria? Like, we are still having to think problem with regard to technology. And again, don't forget, they're very impoverished. They don't have access all of this. And you were talking about hard copies. 
Yes, I agree with you. If there are hard copies that can be given to us, we have been doing our own. We have food printed for our, for our students. We have continuous assessment. We have questions, past questions, and the rest of them done. But however, you, you will agree with me. <laughs> Learning have gone digital. And the uh, digital, digital space is actually where the economy is hanged upon. And any children or any child you're training in this dispensation without hooking up with uh, ICT, it then means we are still very much behind, probably in about two, three centuries behind. So introduction of uh, um, uh, what we call tablets is a way to opening them up to the use of ICT. And of course, they will begin to learn the rudiments and some other things that has to do with that. And by the time they'll be exposed to the major item, I think it will be easier for them to grab with. Again, you were talking about local image. When you talk about local image, I, well, I start to be corrected. I do not know the local image you're talking about here. Because as far as I'm concerned, my field and my experience, we have searched for, and we have not seen anyone that could actually serve the purpose we are talking about. So and I do not know the local image you're talking about and who made it. But as far as I know, um, even the Lagos state government you're talking about, I, I know some of the consultants they've engaged who are doing something, but those things, some of the gadgets, the hardware are imported. They are not locally made. So, but I, whichever way, uh, I think we want to solve the Nigerian education problem. So come on board, let's reason together and let's assist ourselves in ensuring that we are dri driving towards the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that response. The next question I have here is directed to Mr. Kilu Sope. And the question is, given the significant reduction in UBEC funds, why is the backlog of unallocated and unaccessed back funds by states sitting in UBEC not being used for the COVID crisis? If we're sitting on so much money with UBEC, why is it not being used for this emergency, please? Is there a reason? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think I tried answering that question on the chat box. So um, the UBIC fund, um, the, those that are yet to be accessed, um, does not sit with UBIC. Rather, it's at the CBN. So CBN has all these funds. So. Um, why is it not used? I wouldn't know. Um, the federal government would have a better answer to that. And I also remember, uh, I think one of our questions uh, has to do with um, um, the recurrent. So she mentioned the recurrent um, uh, budget. Why is it increasing? And my response to that is, so there's this FY ranking coalition uh, PPDC, budget, SERA, R2K, and the likes. And every year we write to a minimum of um, 200 NDAs. The series of questions from contracts to capital expenditure to even number of staff that the MDA has. And so this year we decided to try that because it was stated in the FY hat that you can ask questions that relate to staff. So even the salaries, the government is meant to provide all this information. And we tried it. Um, we wrote 213 MDAs. And so far, I think I've had like um, maybe 50 responses. Out of the 50 responses, maybe 10 of them gave us the information about the number of staff with the least. They gave some even have over 5,000. <laughs> The salary structure was also there. So why am I saying this? Recurrence can increase if there's a recruitment. And, and that is why we decided to try it out this year to see that, okay, if you were able to have, or well, let's say in 2020, you had, um, let's say 19 staff come 2021, we ask for that information or your recurrent increases in the budget, then, and we ask for the same um, um, uh, request again. And if there's an increase there, so we can justify that, okay, you recruited. That was why there's an increase in recurrence. 
don't forget the recurrent is also personnel plus overhead. So it depends on what is also increasing. Is it the personnel? Or is it the overhead that has to do with the running of the MDA or the agency? So you have to look at that. So uh, like I said, overhead still remains the same in terms of uh, the pension, in terms of um, 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 maintenance of the vehicles, generators. That's the country where we are because we don't have steady um, supply of power. So, it, so we have to put all those uh, budget line items in the budget. So, um, and that is why to keep increasing because we have to maintain so many things. The running cost is high, and which is part of the campaign we are also running to have um, a reduced um, cost of governance because it's so huge. National Assembly is even taking a whole lot, yet the budget is not open. Almost all, not even almost all the statutory agencies don't have their budgets online. So you can't even have access to how the money will be spent, including NDC. How they will spend those funds is not there. And that is why our recurrence will keep increasing. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Please, if Sorry, you have any- in case, in case I didn't answer your question, I think if you have other questions, please do it to ask. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Hello. Hello, ma. Sorry, I fell off for a moment, but I know I had asked that. I just wanted to um, put in a, a word. Okay, please go ahead, ma. Okay. So I just wanted to, so I'm going to put on my video. I just wanted to throw in a note of caution around um, children. I thank you, Dr. Tonchama, for your presentation. I, I found it um, quite helpful, actually. And so we talked about this um, a few weeks ago on a webinar that we held at the African Children's Hospitals Foundation. And, um, Interesting enough, because we were talking about COVID and children, and we're talking about the silence of the pediatric community on, um, on COVID, we had come in thinking that a lot of the conversation was going to be around the physical effects of the pandemic on children. But And I, I omitted this even though it was on my slide. It, we found that actually the greatest um, issues were with children's mental health. So adolescents, um, young children acting out, situational anxiety and depression, increased numbers of children um, acting out and talking back to parents, becoming increasingly agitated. And when they were, some of them actually just, they just want to go back to school because then life will be normal again. So the equation of the pandemic with the distress that they are feeling and the fact that for many of them, parents are losing jobs, and you know, there's death in the family or death in the air. Every day CNN is telling how many people have been infected, how many people have died. You know, children are coming to groups with death between the ages of 10 and 16, 17. We never have experienced one before this. And then suddenly now everybody is talking about the numbers are going every day, the colors in CNN are red and purple, and everybody's looking at, everybody's following. So many of those children are anxious. If you now add this to this um, screen time, virtual schooling, they are completely at odds. Now we know as pediatricians, screen time, which includes television, phone, anything that has four corners, we say limit it to one hour a day. Now here we are advocating and saying, and even joining and giving our children screens where many of us never give our children screens until they're ready to go finishing secondary school, the upper half of secondary school, where now the ones advocating that they use screens. So we are very concerned that there will be mental health issues down the line. It doesn't mean everybody's going to develop, you know, um, overt mental illness. But we do know, and there's documentation to the effect that 
there was there, there was greater incidence of schizophrenia for children who who lived through the Spanish flu than would have been expected. Um, and we don't know why that is, but we are also concerned, and whether it's even related to what nobody knows, we're concerned that we're multiplying effects of screen time, of anxiety, intense anxiety, um, and of bad news and you know, difficult circumstances. So as much as possible, and this is why, this is what makes the case stronger for a return to school when it is safe. I keep saying when it is safe, because not every place is going to be in the same situation. Um, but it also implies that for parents, we have to be very careful what we say in front of children, how we say it, and the conversations around them have to be uplifting, even when um, things are bad. We're not saying hide the truth from them. We're saying recognize that you have a developing brain that is keen into your every anxiety and it can worsen their own anxiety. And having screens around them all the time does not help the issue. If anything, it's, further, it's more likely to complicate it. So I think this is an important thing to take away um, from this is that as people who are interested at the end of the day in the mental health and well-being and roundedness of the child. We have to consider all the impacts of all that's going on, on the eventual outcomes. We don't only want them to grow up into adults, we want them to be functional and to have sound minds. And this is important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. If I may just ask um, one question, which is directed to you. Um, there have been suggestions about posting of public health officials to schools do you think this is implementable or sustainable? Um, you remember that, I, so I think it is, I think it should be done. I remember that I said um, that it would be useful to know what other things we can do and teachers need volunteer support. Um, so depending on what it is we want people to do as public health um, providers, you know, we may want to consider task shifting and task sharing. So everybody that goes to the school doesn't have to be a doctor. We ignore nurses in Nigeria in a way I don't understand. We have nurses. We can take them through a few modules to ensure that they can carry out specific tasks if they are needed. We can work with senior, the community health officers who are usually more experienced than health extension workers. And we can take each locale and look for the public health providers of any kind in those areas because they already know the area and then ensure that they know what it is. So what we are going to ask them to do, we're not asking anybody to diagnose COVID there, but we're asking to look for specific things and they may be part of the people who support implementation checklists and audits. They may be part of the people who provide support for the teachers in classrooms. They may just be a part of when the teacher needs to take a break and somebody can step in and a responsible adult. And there's no reason why we can't have some of our 21, 22 year old youth coppers go and do, perform those functions as well. We just need a little bit of training, a bit of covering the expectations. What do we want you to do when you're there? Um, so everybody doesn't have to be an expert, but certainly everybody can perform whatever tasks. Are required. So yes, I would support it. Sustainability is in our minds. Sustainability doesn't mean we have to pay people. There's such a thing as a volunteer. And I think we should all be ready to become volunteers. We're 200 million people. We can take care of ourselves. Thank you very much, Ma. Yes, can I come yeah. in, please? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. yes uh, sir. Thank you, doctor. Yes, there's, uh, there's this program by the WHO about uh, mental health action program GAP to like scale down uh, mental health issues to involve people at the grassroots, especially using teachers, community health uh, physicians, or community health uh, attendant or extension workers to teach them how to be able to pick mental issues in the community and more especially in children, uh, because this COVID-19 will bring a lot of problems to our children, especially when it comes to uh, issue of uh, anxiety, depression, yeah. you know, and then um, 
you know, even now some students, some students, some students are also involved in drug abuse. So by scaling down this issue to the grassroots, uh, using the mental health action gap or program, it will really go a long way to what to help. The physician, the psychiatrist will have to leave their comfort zones to be able to go to these villages or grassroots, to be able to teach people that are in that the community trusts, you know, to be able to reach out and to be able to pick those silent uh, uh, mental health difficulties among our children. Another issue about uh, that I want to add again is the issue of the e-learning. You know, um, as you said, e-learning will come with so much time for uh, behind the, always on the screen. Some students will start using the communication to start bullying other students, like cyber bullying. And we have, it has been shown that cyber bullying also has led to, to psychiatric problems, especially suicide attempts and sometimes even suicide. So we need to like we emphasize more on the mental health issues on, on this COVID, the impact of mental health issues, because we are going to come across it uh, much later in our life. And then, as I said earlier, that 50% of our elderly, our, our adult, our adults that have mental health issues started from um, uh, childhood. And coupled with this double tragedy of, uh, of the COVID-19 itself and the fear it, it brought, it's really, it's, it will go a long way to really help. So uh, for reaching out, I think we need the public health uh, physicians and the mental health uh, practitioners to, to go down to the grassroots to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that um, highlights and for the insights. We sincerely appreciate it. At this point in time, please permit me to invite my colleague, Tolu Ojeshino, a program officer with P1 for a recap of the key insights that we've gained from this discussion and closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Hadiza. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you as well for bearing with us. We have gone beyond the time we allocated for this, but it's been a very fruitful conversation. There's been a lot of things that have come out of this. So just to quickly recap, uh, I think one of the major things that we have highlighted here is that this discussion needs to be looked at from different perspectives. So while um, children resuming in school is important because they, they, they have missed out on some learnings over the past few months, there are other things to consider such as whether or not the government with regards to the public schools is ready, financially ready to provide all the necessary materials needed for children to resume school safely. There's also the conversation about how this affects the welfare of teachers as well. Teachers, um, if the schools do not resume, how teachers are going to be able to fend for themselves, especially the private school teachers. Um, another thing that we need to look at is and that came out strongly here is the fact that while there's a need for a national response or cohesive response to this issue, it needs to also have some context. So each school, each local government, each state needs to examine within themselves and assess if they are ready to resume and, if the, and also look at how the virus is spreading within their locality to ensure that they are not just adopting a suggestion or recommendation that has been made and then putting children's lives at risk. So I think what one thing that has come out strongly for us here is whether or not schools resume or they, whether or not schools resume or not, they need to be able to have put in place all the necessary measures that are required for resumption of school. So um, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone that has joined this presentation. We, ha we are way, way, way behind time, but we appreciate every comment, every question. We are going to ensure that this recording is on our Facebook page. So whoever that would like to go back to just watch and pull out some recommendations from this can, can do that. And we'll also develop a report that will be shared with all um, attendees and all panelists. So on behalf of the Rule of Law and Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa and Nigeria, we say thank you for joining us in today's webinar. And we hope that if we call on you for subsequent discussions, which we might have related to this and other issues that you will join us as well. So thank you for joining us and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
thank you. Uh, thank you. Tundu, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Aliza. Thank you. Thank you, Tolu. Thank you, Adiza. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right.